Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Printed Circuit Podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. In this episode, we'll focus on FPGA PCB co-design. And here to join me in this discussion is Gary Lemires, Technical Marketing Engineer with Siemens. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Can you give our audience a brief introduction of your background and what you bring to the table for Siemens? Yeah, I've been working with Siemens since 2008. So I've been working as a technical marketing engineer for electronics design. In this role, I've been working on FPGAs and PCB co-design. This is one of my favorite topics because multidiscipline integration, especially when it comes to a double E or your FPGA engineer and your PCB designer, it's key to make sure that you're doing what you can to mitigate any redundant back and forth, back and forth handoffs. So can you give us some feedback, especially as we get into this, you know, what doesn't work today when it comes to FPGA and PCB co-design? Well, what doesn't work today is just designing the FPGA, throwing it over the fence and letting the PCB engineer handle it. That doesn't work at all. First, printed circuit board engineer and the part librarians have to design their parts. So by designing the parts specifically toward the FPGA, design engineers specifications, they may be over-constraining their system, and that may cause difficulties in routing, optimization, and performance of the printed circuit board. It's a very thorough process, and from my experience, when it's not followed consistently, you, you tend to run into problems. And the, the, getting it right from the beginning, correct by construction, is key, and it's key to have that collaboration. So tell me, we know what, what the problems can be. What do we see as the solution for best practices when we think about PCB designers, what they should implement, especially when we talk about that collaboration? What we should see is discussion ahead of time with the FPGA engineer on which family or at least device that they are interested in designing with. A lot of times they pick a device to begin with, but it may change over time to a second device for actual production by the time you get to the design and the physical design of the printed circuit board. So by starting this conversation with the uh, PCB team ahead of time can improve the quality of your final results. I agree with you. I think, you know, we need this FPGA PCB co-design because it's an optimized approach for PCB design when we're implementing FPGAs into design. Using this co-design functionality, especially within Expedition, the Grouping signals can be created easily to manage the complexity of high pin count parts, especially when we think about the different sizes and how you know they're becoming more and more dense in the, these FPGAs, and it accelerates the pin assignment process. Absolutely. By uh, working with the PCB team, the PCB team may give some feedback that, no, this FPGA device isn't in our uh, tool suite for automatic optimization. Can you switch to this other PCB? Or the PCB team can ask Siemens Engineering, can you produce the model for the specific FPGA device that we need? And oftentimes, we can turn a new model in several weeks. Can you walk me through, especially when we talk about the best practice processes that's out there, can you walk me through some examples of how this would work? Well, the best practice process would be uh, obtaining a model for one of our tools or one of the uh, vendor tools, if you're not using the Siemens Expedition product, that will actually create a FPGA symbol for you. And we do this with internally with our tool with a product called IO Optimizer FPGA Wizard. So we have more than 18,000 models of FPGAs that we can read and then make custom symbols match it to a uh, cell footprint that uh, you need to actually place on your printed circuit board. And these models can then be fully defined in conjunction with the FPGA engineer to uh, optimize the circuit board routing. That's best, especially when we talk about what is the return on investment of implementing that kind of integration in in co-design and how much time you're going to save downstream if you get this done up front and get it early on, especially when you talk about pin assignments and having to do repin configuration because a rat's nest coming out of a FPGA or BGA is, could be extremely complicated to deal with. Imagine as an FPGA librarian building the symbol, 
if you have to build the symbol uh, manually, you have no idea up front how the uh, partitions and the gates are assigned. You have no idea how uh, the FPGA comes, the data is uh, going to be laid out. Are the voltages going to be correct in each segment, in each partition of the FPGA? So all of this needs to be uh, thought up front and developed in conjunction with the FPGA engineer and your PCB team. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, again, this goes back to upfront collaboration. The sooner you, you shift that task, shift it left and move it upstream and take advantage of that early on in the process, it will save time downstream uh, for sure. Absolutely. And once it's placed on the board, how you do that is you read in the uh, data from your FPGA development tools. So the FPGA engineer has been working in his development system. He can export out files that we can read in into our tool, which is IO Optimizer. And then the uh, routing can be assigned either in the FPGA tool. It can be uh, pre-assigned in the schematic. And this routing can then first be uh, used to uh, lay out the board or at least see what the rat's nest on the board is. And after the, that rat's nest is analyzed by the uh, layout team, you can simply select banks of circuits, circuit lines, or uh, partitions in your FPGA and have these automatically optimized for results to their end destinations. What's really cool is the ability to do this in the front end when you're doing your pin assignments, when the double E is, is selecting that. You know, the efficiency of the IO optimizer and, and within the tool set is, is very slick and it's very time saving downstream. You know, utilizing the automation, the horsepower and the tools today can really make a significant impact downstream. Absolutely. It's been shown to reduce the number of layers that a PCB has. It's been uh, shown to reduce your propagation delay. It's been uh, visibly uh, shown to improve your routing. And as we know that when designers are developing stuff, parts move on the PC board. <laughs> no, they never uh, move. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. No, this doesn't go over here. No, this doesn't go over there. So parts move. So the advantage about having a model built and the FPGA optimizer is that we can move these components around on the board, make design decisions on the fly, and re-optimize. So you can retune the circuit. You're not fixed with the uh, initial oh, I've optimized this ready. I can't do it again. I can redo it multiple times. I was working on a design several years ago with a uh, company, and we re-optimized that design a dozen times as we were relaying out the board for additional design efficiencies. I remember early in my career where I was actually creating like on a graph paper, engineering graph paper, I was creating... Uh, I'd actually draw the where the pins are of a, a FPGA, and then I would actually with colored pencils or colored pins, I would map out. Okay, this is how I'm going to escape out of here, and then no erase, and then I would do that all manually first before I actually implemented that in my tool. And God forbid if there was a change, oh my God, it was just it was a hassle to deal with. And as you know, I evolved throughout my career, and the tools evolved. It's amazing to see the automation today that, that has, enables us to be more effective and more efficient and optimized in our approach to designing such complex designs, especially in these components that are getting more dense and more dense and smaller packages. And it's crazy, especially when you talk about pin pitch of BGAs. It's really crazy. They get to be extremely tight today. Yeah. So tell me, what do you see our roadblocks to implementing you know, these best practices that you know, we've talked about? Development teams and engineers think it takes too long to uh, train to use one of these <laughs> systems. Yeah. And it really doesn't. Yes, the first time you do an FPGA with our tool, it does take you a little bit of time, but you can quickly go through our training material and you can quickly learn and start to use our data and uh, IO optimizer within days. Those days will actually save you multiple days in the end result, because as I said before, I had a dozen times where, no, we moved the FPGA just a little bit. We rotated it. We uh, changed where the memory banks were. All sorts of design decisions happened that because we spent that time up front 
learning how to create the initial model, all we had to do was spend minutes to re-optimize the design on the board, and then we could uh, back annotate that to the layout and further analyze whether that was a good layout or whether we needed to have more time spent on the layout process. Always the biggest challenge, in my opinion, for a designer is adapting to change. One thing that we seen for sure that coming out of COVID was that part availability was a huge issue. And then you hear the, you know, the phrase design for resilience or design for supply chain resilience, meaning how do you handle a design where you're already like three quarters of the way through layout and all of a sudden you got to change circuitry because the parts are no longer available or the, the lead time of those parts are 52 weeks. So you got to come up with new circuitry, which means it's a ripple effect for designers. Now you got to go back and relay out, rip up traces and rip up planes and re- reestablish that circuitry somewhere in the board. It's a nightmare. So it's, it's key to be able to do things more efficiently. And I think the FPGA PCB co-design collaboration with, uh, within you know, our tool sets, the, the solutions that Siemens offers is, is amazing. And it, it can really be a game changer if and when implemented. Absolutely. It's a tremendous game changer. And one of those devices might even be the FPGA itself that gets swapped out. Oh, yeah. It may not be exactly pin for pin uh, footprint compatible. It may be just a little different or pin pitch is different or it could be a number of things. You know, when we think about the roadblocks and we stand back and one of the things I always talked about was in in several different podcasts or or lectures that I give, especially when I was at uh, a recent conference and talking to other engineers there during one of my sessions is how do you overcome, you know, roadblocks within your organization? What is your take on that? How would someone overcome that? You have to be bold and show them the design efficiencies that can actually occur through the automation. Everybody's talking about AI right now. We had this AI for quite some time now in the optimization of your FPGA. And not only that, we also have another tool, Expedition Schematic Analysis, also known as Validate, which creates data sheets of every single component on your design. And when you read in the net list and you read in the design, you can then export out from our FPGA tools the precise net list so that you know that all the ins are connected to a input, all the outs are connected to the proper location, and that you have the correct voltages everywhere. I mean, these FPGA devices, we often find multiple voltages attached to them. And it only takes one wrong voltage being attached, and you blow up this expensive device. Some of these devices cost tens of thousands of dollars. Don't even get me started with uh, schematic analysis, because I will tell you, Validate has saved my rear in one instance uh, where the tool paid for itself for what it saved. And I've mentioned this in, in in another podcast previously regarding doing that analysis because it, it doesn't, most of our tools today, uh, they'll check for your schematic connection. What that analysis does is, is, is doing an engineering analysis. Is your circuitry biased correctly? Do you have the right voltages applied to the specific pins? And it does far more than just a simple connection check. Is it an open net or is it, it you, know, you have a single pin net? No, it's it's far more sophisticated than that. And like I said, that's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother itself. podcast. But <laughs> it's important to know that our FPGA tools can interface to that, that we can develop a model to validate, that you can check your design multiple ways. Also, when we can, you export out the device data back to the FPGA engineer, and he runs his own timings. He runs his own analysis whether the end results are correct. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, Gary. And again, it is this seamless collaboration that you have between FPGA and PCB disciplines uh, to allow this co-design integration to really uh, positively impact the results of, of the full design cycle. I think we've outlined our best practices uh, when it comes to FPGA PCB co-design. You know, Gary, I want to thank you for your invaluable insights and, and coming on board today and chatting with me about your insight and your views on FPGA PC co-design and then sharing it with the audience. Thank you. This has been a tremendous opportunity. I really uh, look forward to this. I had a lot of apprehension up front (laughs) doing my first podcast. So uh, I was thrilled and terrified. 
<laughs> no worries. You did great. You did great. You know, the fact is, is that like me, you're a true designer at heart. It's great content. And uh, we definitely want to share it with the with our industry and, and, and our audience to pass on the industry best practices. And this is what we're doing. This is what we're here for. So cool. Thanks again. And to our audience, please keep following along with more PCB design best practices. Mm-hmm.